uh, hi, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a public event of uh, European Graduate School. I'm Larin Dolar, I'll be uh, moderating this discussion. Uh, the European Graduate School has a long history of uh, public lectures, which were widely available um, on the, over the, the YouTube. And they basically happened during the sessions, but now the sessions are mostly hybrid. So this is a new platform, a new form of these public events. Um, there, there will be several of them. And today's event, uh, the occasion for today's event is the publication of this book by Alenka Zupancic. Here is the book, Let Them Rot, Antigone's Parallax. The book was published uh, a couple of months ago by Fordham University Press. And it already attracted a lot of attention and uh, caused ripples around the globe. There are several um, translations already underway. And um, I would just mention by way of introduction, this is Alenka's uh, fifth book in English. And to remind you, the first one was The Ethics of the Real on Kant and Lacan in, in, in 2000. Then The Shortest Shadow, the, the book on Nietzsche in 2003. Then uh, The Odd One In, the book on comedy in 2008. Then What is Sex on Sex and Ontology in 2017. And now Let Them Rot, uh, this book on Antigone, which just, uh, just appeared. So uh, looking at this uh, list, Kant's ethic, uh, Nietzsche, comedy, sex, and Antigone. What the hell do all these topics have in common? Is there a common denominator? Well, there is. I mean, this, there is uh, Alinka Zupancic and her very, very unique voice in the landscape of contemporary theory, a voice which really keeps the Lacanian theory vivid and, and alive. And each of these books were actually kind of uh, events. Uh, each was an event, a, a landmark in this uh, particular field, although the fields are quite separate. And well, the, it, despite the separate nature of these fields, there is nevertheless uh, le même combat. There is the same battle, the same struggle going on, the same conceptual stakes are being pursued. Is a, there is a red thread through these five different antipoints. Um, so each of them present a kind of landmark, and um, the book on comedy instigated the whole area of comedy studies. And um, this last book is uh, perhaps most most remarkable in this respect because Antigone is uh, one of the most commented texts in the entire European cultural history, stretching back 2,500 years, actually. 2,464 years precisely since the first staging of Antigone, which happened in 441 BC in, in Athens. So ever since then, there have been new versions of Antigone produced, remakes of Antigone endlessly, and a number of very different theoretical reflections on this particular topic. So the whole of uh, European cultural history could actually be written through the spyglass of uh, various texts on Antigone. And indeed, in uh, 1985, George Steiner uh, published this uh, famous book, Antigonis, which was a kind of repertory, a compendium of all different versions and different um, perspectives, perspectives on Antigone. And although this book is like 30, 35 years old, it's, it's, it already seems that it's um, out of date. It would need a lengthy supplement because so many things happened in Antigone studies in the, in the last decades. So um, I think this intervention is, is all the more remarkable because in this very crowded field, which seems saturated, where all kinds of approaches have already been tried out, it really presents a new perspective. It pre presents a fresh perspective, and uh, it's kind of it feels it's kind of game changer. Despite it being a rather thin book, like of eighty odd pages, is one of the thinnest books on Antigone, I would imagine. Um, so um, 
it's quite it's quite a feat to present a new take a new perspective in a field which has been tried out explored explored so much this is what we will be talking about today so there are four panelists uh, i don't think i need to present them really uh, now in in the order of appearance uh, we first give the word to Alenka as the author, and then in the order of appearance is uh, Chris Finsk, who is the Dean of the European Graduate School, then Eric Santner from the Germanic Department at the University of Chicago, then Frank Ruda uh, from the University of Dundee in Scotland, and finally Slavoj Zizek, whom I especially don't need to present, Except for saying that uh, Slava has written extensively on Antigone in the in the past, and he's also the author of um, uh, a theatre play, The Three Lives of Antigone, which is uh, around, which is being produced, and there was uh, a recent, um, very much acclaimed production actually at the Residenz Theatre in in Munich. So Antigone, Antigone continues to be staged. In various ways, new versions are being produced and new theoretical takes. And Alenkas is really outstanding and uh, surprising. I mean, in its simplicity, as it were. Um, the, it's surprising that uh, one can produce such a fresh view of a very old, old uh, uh, classical text. So, without further ado, I will uh, pass the word. First to Alenka. Yes, uh, we uh, the we now for the first round. Each each of the panelists will have about ten minutes. I won't be strict about this, but roughly ten minutes to present um, an opening statement or reflection or questions or whatever. Um, and then I guess we'll pass the, the word to Alenka again uh, to give some response or reactions. And then in the second round, um, well, there is no particular order. We will just, uh, no, no prescribed order of appearance. We will just continue the discussion for another hour. This should take about about two hours. And I myself is, will more or less take the role of a traffic policeman in this, uh, in this discussion. So Alenka, I, I give you the word. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mladen, for this uh, generous introduction and also for taking the role of the traffic policeman, which is kind of, uh, thank you, very generous. And of course, I would really like to thank uh, all of you uh, for taking part in this. I'm looking forward to it very much. Uh, but since there are like five of us and time is limited, uh, let me just cut to the chase and uh, uh, to use up my 10 minutes as uh, efficiently as possible. Uh, of course, I'm not trying. I, I want uh, going to try to sum up the arguments of the book. Uh, this would be rather impossible, uh, but I will rather I will I'm going to make like two perhaps yeah two additional remarks uh, that are both very much related to the arguments of the book uh, but perhaps even take them further or emphasize some new angles. So the first remark concerns the question of limits, you know, the fact that Antigone is situated in several respects at some limit point, or that her actions challenge and question certain limits, dividing lines, positions, for example, life, death, public, private, law, crime, and so on. A lot has been written on this. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to, to emphasize that actually Antigone does not simply question uh, these limits or expose their untenability in some ways and so on, which I also argue in the book. Uh, but what she does is something perhaps even more precise and radical, kind of splitting each side from within, performing a concrete way, in a concrete way, uh, complex operation of kind of double negation, certain neither nor. Uh, 
Um, and to to give you an example, and as uh, uh, Nasa Udenstak has pointed pointed out in her very good text called Antigone as Kurdish Politician, this is a relatively recent text. Uh, she argues Antigone does not only violate or transgress the public law that is Creon's decree, but her act is also transgressive of kinship relationships. She betrays her uncle and her father-in-law to be. So her loyalty to her brother also involves a rejection or a betrayal of her other immediate kin. And uh, actually, in a very interesting way, uh, Ustindak places this uh, alongside several female figures of the Kurdish opposition in Turkey, just to give you an idea briefly, the first of these women is uh, uh, Laila Zana, who was actually the first Kurdish identified female activist that became deputy in the Turkish parliament in 1991. When she took the oath, speaking Kurdish in official spaces was still illegal. Leila Zana has wore a hairband in yellow, red, and green, the, the colors of Kurdistan. And already for this, there were protests from the entire room as she walked towards the stage to take the oath. Uh, and after swearing the parliamentary oath, uh, Leila Zana switched to Kurdish and added just this one sentence in Kurdish, I take this oath for the brotherhood between the Turkish people and the Kurdish people. So when asked to just repeat the oath in Turkish without adding anything, because this supposedly didn't count, she did it only the third time. So second time she repeated this same Kurdish phrase along with it. So you see the transgression does involve just one sentence uttered in, uh, in Kurdish and a hairband one within the walls of the parliament, but it was enough to bring uh, Leila Zena to the kind of tragedy of being imprisoned for a decade. Because soon after that, her party, People's Labour Party, was banned and Zena was stripped of her immunity and so on. But uh, this is not the reason. I mean, what is really good in this example is that Zana did not only transgress the Turkish law, she also ignored her friends from the opposition. The atmosphere in the parliament was already extremely heated at that point, and other Kurdish MPs were coming one by one to her, warning her not to say anything, not to do anything like this. Uh, so, uh, and actually, Leila Zana was well aware of the violence unleashed by these performers. Uh, as her words later testify, she writes, uh, it was as if I had put dynamite on the walls of the parliament. And um, Eustin Deck asks the, the right question here. She says, where does her desire come from and what feeds it so that she ends up not only betraying the nation state, but also the very people who welcomed her into the party? So you see the similar similarities with Antigone are kind of striking by disregarding Ismina's advice and by disrespecting and defying Creon, her father-in-law to be, who gave her shelter and food. Uh, Antigone is not only transgressing the limits of the state law, but also the limits of the laws, let's say, of hospitality and generosity. Uh, and by associating, and this is a very good point that Deck makes by associating Creon with the law of the state, many feminists are missing the point that Antigone commits treason in the realm of the household as well. So there is this kind of uh, double treason, as I said, splitting from within both sides of these oppositions that she's kind of caught in or uh, um, represents. Uh, and of course, in the case of uh, Leila Zana, many people comment and did comment that she harmed the Kurdish cause uh, and that it took almost 20 years to repair the damage done by this so-called old crisis and to recreate a working electoral alliance with the democratic left. So, uh, but I think that it is precisely this kind of double betrayal that lies um, uh, in the, that, uh, that, that 
gives this kind of troubling dimension to Antigone uh, and uh, this kind of profound ambiguity and unease that her character sometimes evokes. That is precisely when she is not simply portrayed as a heroine of human rights or simply of kinship and loyalty. That there is this kind of a, a radically unsettling further uh, thing. Uh, but I think it is also precisely in this that resigns perhaps uh, the properly political power of her act. Act, And this perhaps, this is how I read it. Slavoj will be able to, to say if I'm wrong here. Uh, when in a recent commentary on Antigone also, uh, he, he refers to her act as not simply an ethical suspension of the political, but also rather a political suspension suspension of the ethical. So um, this is, we are here in a kind of, um, yeah, tricky waters. And uh, so, and I would, I would say further on, uh, then precisely I would use this to, to bring into the discussion, the second remark that I would like to make today, which concerns actually the issue of desire. As if you remember already, this author, Ustundak, uh, asked this question, what does her desire, where does it come from, what is her desire when she does the, both these things, uh, also in relationship to, um, to Lalnia. So, of course, it was already Lacan who centered his commentary on, uh, on of Antigone on the issue of desire. Uh, I also conclude the book with the section on desire, although I think uh, I am not satisfied with this very last part, I think more can be and should be said about desire. And I'm also currently working on this. And perhaps the time has come also perhaps to pursue further the political dimension of desire, not only of course, its ethical dimension. Uh, you, know, you know, desire is well known for its kind of negative movement toward its never being satisfied for, for always saying that is not it, or neither this nor that, and so on. But one sometimes tends to forget that this negative movement, this double negation, which is indeed essential, uh, comes from desire moving in the orbit of an absolute condition on which it does not yield. So it's not simply meton. Um, so if the fundamental statement of desire is this is not it, this is not because it is, I don't know, so picky or satisfied, wouldn't be satisfied with nothing, but because the structure with which and from which desire emerges is itself based on nothing, on something kind of fallen out of it, of this same structure. And to put it very briefly, it is this fallen out thing, this object that has no being, that constitutes the object cause of desire or its absolute condition, that is to say also the condition of its very metonymical movement. So just two more minutes, please. I think what uh, Lacan um, does also in his take on desire and also hysteria is something very different from reducing them to a kind of, to, or for instance, reducing hysteria to a kind of psychological type. Uh, he kind of starts out from what we may call a fundamental imbalance of being, that is with being constituting itself around something falling out. Being where well, being is the other side of something falling out of being. And he points that the subject, precisely qua subject of desire, emerges from this imbalance, from this lack of being, by way of subjectivizing it in this or that way. So in other terms, subject is the way in which the, the imbalance, the neg negative core of, of the structure appears, takes place within this structure itself, as an event within this structure itself. And this, I claim, is the event of desire, precisely. It is something which, within the structure that gave rise to desire, brings to the fore the gap that gave rise to it. So in this sense, desire is uh, somewhat like a play within a play. And hence, perhaps, it's often theatrical aspect associated especially with hysteria. It kind of 
plays out, performs, reenacts the very excluded fallen out condition of its own existence. It kind of reintroduces, brings this absolute condition into play, into reality, forces, forces us to look at it, to, to, to manage it in some way. And like a play within a play, just think of the mousetrap in Hamlet, it is also a kind of figuration of truth, not its revelation or disclosure, but precisely its figuration. And this fictitious figuration is the way, the only way of inscribing into reality the real of an exclusion on which this reality is founded. So despite its highly subject, subjective at stake, the hysterical desire or desire to cool is about giving body to the impossible, to the crack that forms and forms the given structure itself. There is this kind of irreducible, also objective dimension to it. So, and I will conclude with this, uh, in its most elemental structure, I would say desire signals, draws attention to the imbalance then sustains the order of being and aims perhaps beyond all objects to, to shake that order. Of course, this radical aim and dimension of desire can be lost in the everyday economy of desire, for desire is also known for often actively sustaining the order precisely about which it complains and which it um, kind of puts down. Uh, but I think this would be my get, my, um, my yeah my bet that this possible economy should not prevent us from recognizing the inherently upsetting in all the possible meanings of this term, inherently upsetting, as well as orientating, new orientating dimension of desire that plays, I think, a key role in virtually all genuine emancipatory political struggles. Okay, thank you. This was my opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Alenka. Thank you for this uh, very illuminating too additions to, to, to your take on Antigone. And uh, yes, without uh, any further ado, I, will, I would pass the word to Chris Finsk. Chris, please. And unmute yourself, unmute, you, unmute yourself, Chris. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, um, thank you so much, um, Alenka. The, the book is so rich that I had, uh, sort of threads of questions. Um, and I thought to myself, how am I going to tie this together? And in the, in the second, before the last part of your statement, I said, I'm going to go to the question of desire. And what does she do? She immediately um, hits the question of desire. So um, I, I th thank you for that. I'm, uh, I have, uh, yes, I have really only threads. And some of those threads were sort of coming together around the, um, the scene you know, the, the, the famous uh, Comos of, of Antigone, where she um, enters her lamentation and compares herself to Niobe. Um, and I, 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 there were two questions that came together for me there. Um, uh, yes, one of them, and I'm gonna to come to that second, but one of them is, uh, uh, bears on, uh, the affect uh, at work in Antigone's uh, actions. And, and, and this is why I was starting to go toward the question of desire. Um, I, 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 did, I tried to do a reading of the play in which I focused on the, on the topic of philia. Um, because as, as I, I, I see at least five points in the play where this is actually being debated. And Antigone is taking a position with respect to um, her responsibilities, both with regard to her family and to the um, and to the polis. Um, and you see, these these are quite extraordinary exchanges. And the very first one is with Ismin, uh, or Ismene, I'm not sure how we pronounce that, uh, where she denies to uh, her sister the philia in which she is acting. And uh, and there's immediately a separation. And then there's another great scene, another great exchange of this with with Creon, where Creon says that uh, the the one who is philos is only one who is uh, faithful to the state. Where there cannot be a friendship outside the state. Um, 
And so this 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 is constantly being debated what the status of her um, uh, uh, fidelity to her brother is uh, in relation to the other uh, kin that, that you referred to. And as, as you mentioned, it's extremely ambiguous and it's extremely difficult to figure out um, in the name of what uh, Antigone is acting. I think you've given beautiful answers and, and it's uh, very rich and, and the ex ex explanation of the relation to the, the brother that requires bearing, it's all uh, very compelling. And, and so I don't have a, a question in a strong sense, but I'm just wondering if, if you could um, uh, 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 perhaps address this question of affect a little bit more. Um, I, you know, in, in Oedipus, uh, there is a very powerful affect at work and that is Oedipus's fear. Uh, Oedip Oedipus is terrified. And, and we see this work through the play. Um, Jocasta refers to it. Um, Tiresias is, picks it up. It, it's, it's, um, it, it's working through. Um, Antigone is in a strange uh, devotion to something she can barely articulate, but, but it, it appears to be death. Um, that she is, and she, she says, I have died already and I will serve the dead. Um, so unlike her sister, uh, Ismene, Ismene, speaks in the name of life and prefers death. She says, life is not worth living now that this is happening. I, I go with you. And Antigone refuses her, even though this is a public act on this means part. Uh, Antigone refuses her and says, uh, no, um, I act um, for death in the name of death. And so it's a, you know, Ismene is in the name of life, Antigone is in the name of death. And so that she does seem to have, there does seem to be a quite active death drive at work and a, and a, and a certain philia for death, uh, uh, um, an inclination toward death as Heidegger would interpret the notion of, of philia there. And, um, but, but the affect is strange. It's, 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 it's not as easy to capture. And at the moment of the turn in the play where she then uh, has been condemned to death and is going down and she's been recognized as almost divine in her, uh, uh, um, stature at this point. Um, uh, the, uh, she, she turns to lament and she says, I go to my death uh, unwept and unloved without, without tears and without friends. And she keeps insisting, I have no friends in this, uh, in this moment. So it's, you know, friendship is, is, is and philia, uh, uh, love, if you will, um, uh, this inclination is, is a, is is a is a highly contested topic here, and I and I, I was just wondering if you could uh, offer a little bit more um, perspective on that. Perhaps the one thing other that I was I, I was I'm very interested in the way in which you're reading the play um, politically. I think that's totally compelling. Again, I think it's very important. I love the way you started with that in such a powerful way, and and pursued it through. And I I love your your development uh, just now with regard to uh, Lila Zana. Um, very powerful, and I'm very moved by it. I was wondering in this respect, how you might see um, the way the play turns with respect to Antigone's role. Because, and, and Haman, curiously, plays a very uh, important role in this. Um, a, a, this is something that, that Holonen pointed to in his reading of the play, that when he talks about the, the tragic turn by which the god and uh, man couple and split, um, he, he mentions Oedipus and he mentions Haman. He doesn't mention Antigone, although in his reading of Antigone, he's clearly thinking about Antigone in the same way. But what's in, it, what he, I think the reason that he's mentioning Haman is that um, he says, he, he's, he reads the play as a civil, as, as representing a civil rebellion a civic rebellion, a, a revolutionary moment. And he's trying to account for what he talks about as, as a reversal in patriotic forms, as he puts it. Uh, Heyman is very interesting because in some sense he's, uh, I don't know, his, his, he, he hardly gets a prominent role, but he does have the role of identifying how the people are reacting it, it to this. Because he says to his father, you have violated um, a, 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 the, the name of the, the God um, in your actions. So this is, a, this is a religious fault and it's a kind of, of um, criminal act that, that you, you point to. Um, and then he says, and I must tell you, the people are whispering. And, and as he talks, this becomes more and more powerful. In fact, the people are turning against you. And as, my, and as your son, I must tell you this. 
Um, at which point Creon, of course, uh, um, reacts extremely violently. Hemon responds equally violently, and, and, and we know what happens to Hemon. The chorus then comes in and sings about Eros with regard to Hemon. They account this behavior on Hemon's part to, to Eros. Um, he will go to his death, and then we have uh, Antigone come on, come on to the um, come on to the stage in her splendor, which Lacan has uh, picked up. I think you know, this is in you know, Holonen was very attentive to this, and, and uh, Heidegger as well. Um, she appears in her splendor, and uh, and then she starts a lament, which uh, uh, she, a lament in which she's saying, "I am abandoned." Um, I, uh, she up to this point she has been uh, powerfully solitary, excluding others from her act. Now she complains of abandonment, but she's in a sort of almost ecstatic, transfigured state, and and starts to starts this lament. And again, I I, I, I you know I, I start to wonder about what's happening to the uh, uh, well, what has been driving her you know, up to this point in in this uh, in this passage. So we have this. At, at this at this crucial moment, we have the, the the play is turning politically. The people have now shown themselves to be um, uh, with her. Uh, the chorus, um, a, a, when they see her uh, break down in tears, it's a cathartic moment, as we would use the word in contemporary uh, language. They 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 dissolve in tears for a moment, and. Um, uh, uh, and then, and then she she appears and and has this extraordinary stature, but also this wavering. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask about affect and all of that, um, and whether whether that word has any uh, uh, purchase for you, or whether you might want to 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 speak to that in some way. Miladin, I forget. Are we having an exchange immediately after the questions, or are we going to wait until the qu the questions have been posed? No, I, I think we we still uh, we, we first have ten minutes each to make some sort okay. of opening statement. Well, I think questions. that I have probably the link, I think I can accumulate the questions and then respond after everybody has done um, this opening bit, and Excellent. the second half will be a more unstructured sort yeah. of uh, discussion. Excellent. Um, uh, Alenka, forgive my very broken way of responding. It's because I'm so compelled by your text, and I, and I have, you know, I come to it like many of us with our own obsessions with Antigone. So I'm just uh, asking you about mine. Maybe I'm asking you about my desire. But um, in any case, uh, I, I, I want to thank you very warmly for this for this uh, beautiful piece of work. And with that, Chris, I'll... I noted down. I mean, I noted your question. So hopefully, at least some things I will be able to to. Uh, to respond to them. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. I think uh, the next uh, person to intervene in this panel is Eric Santner. So, Eric, Eric, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. I was um, too nervous just to speak, you know, off the cuff. So, I wrote six pages and I'm just going to read it. Um, is that okay, Miladin? Okay. I just. <clears throat> okay. Miladin, can you hear me? Am I audible? No, no, yes, 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 I can hear okay. you. I, I, I muted myself. This oh, okay. okay. In her remarkable new book, Alenka argues that one can only really grasp what is at stake in so-called Oedipal desire by exploring the tensions and contradictions that become manifest in Antigone in what she ultimately elaborates as Antigonal desire. The word manifest that I used is meant to recall Nietzsche's reflections on tragedy as an Apollinean dream image staged in response to the shudder of Dionysian jouissance, and of course Freud's theory of the manifest content of dreams as a distorted representation not only of so-called latent dream thoughts, but also and more fundamentally as a response to and recoil from a limit, from an unnameable indeterminate loss constitutive of human being. This, this point of repulsion concerns what Freud referred to as the navel, navel of the dream. To quote the famous lines from the interpretation of dreams, there is often a passage in even the most thoroughgoingly interpreted dream, which has to be left obscure. This is because we become aware during the work of interpretation that at that point, there is a tangle of dream thoughts which cannot be unraveled and which moreover adds nothing to our knowledge of the content of the dream. This is the dream's navel the spot where it reaches down into the unknown. The dream thoughts to which we are led by interpretation cannot from the nature of things have any definite endings. They are bound to branch out 
in every direction into the intricate network of our world of thought. It is at some point where this ne network is particularly close that the dream wish grows up like the mushroom of its mycel uh, mycelium. Alenka has brought us into the neighborhood of this zero level of knowledge, of the navel of the dream elaborated in the Oedipus trilogy, the point at which the singularity of this most dysfunctional of families appears to provide an oneric allegory of anthropogenesis, of something like the birth trauma of culture, or at the very least of a certain civilization. Among the reasons that the play continues to resonate so strongly across the generations is that this trauma is in some sense never quite over, or rather that it happens over and over. One might recall here Emil Durkheim's characterizations of his own investigations into the origin of religion. Quote, like every other human institution, religion begins nowhere. The problem I pose is altogether different. I would like to find a means of discerning the ever-present causes on which the most basic form of religious thought and practice depend. Alenka's book goes a long way in helping us to understand why Antigone happens over and over. As Lacan, in a passage cited by Alenka, puts it, the anthropogenic threshold, the, quote, ex nihilo to which Antigone is attached, grew her brother, for Lacan, a kind of man without qualities, quote, Mrs. Lacan, is nothing more than the break that the very presence of language inaugurates into the life of man, end of quote. In a word, the, the birth trauma of culture concerns words and the fateful things one can do with them. Alenka locates two primary fields for the analysis of this existential natality, one political or perhaps political theological and one more properly psychoanalytic. I'll only focus on the first. The political field on which Antigone plays out concerns from the start what for Carl Schmitt, defi what for Carl Schmitt defines politics to court, namely the friend-enemy distinction, philos and ekthros. We find ourselves in the immediate aftermath, aftermath of the siege of Thebes by an Argive army raised by Polynices to claim the Theban throne, denied to him by his brother Eteocles. Both brothers are now dead after hand-to-hand -hand combat. These events have generated an impasse. The friend, the philos of Thebes, Polynices, has become a traitor and enemy, and thus, according to the practices of Periclean Athens, should be buried in a pit outside the city walls or cast into the sea. As Antigone puts it in the opening dialogue with her sister, the doom reserved for enemies marches on the ones we love the most. Creon's treatment of Polynices as a traitor and enemy is, in other words, by and large, consonant with his allegiance to the principles of an emergent democratic form of life, one in which the Homeric tradition of mourning and lamentation focused on individual heroes, typically performed by women, was being displaced by democratic practices and attitudes in which what mattered most was the contribution of the dead, whatever clan they might have belonged to, to the glory of the polis. The new stance regarding the right to enjoy rites of mourning informs Pericles' funeral oration as report, reported by Thucydides a decade after the performance of Antigone. In the oration, Pericles encourages bereaved mothers to move past their grief, grief and, if they can, replace the dead with more sons. In, a more, in the more familiar terms of the play, the struggle between Creon and Antigone over the friend-enemy distinction concerns the shift whereby citizenship in the polis and the positive laws that frame it comes to trump kinship and the unwritten laws that regulate it as the key to drawing this line. As Creon puts it in the ship of state speech that introduces him to the audience, quote, and whoever places a friend above the good of his country, he is nothing. And shortly after, only while she, our country, voyages true on course, can we establish friendships truer than blood. What is decisive, however, as Alenka shows, is the surplus violence, the excess stain in Creon's refusal to allow for the burial or mourning of Polynices. His decision not simply to bury Polynices outside the city walls, and one will recall that in Oedipus at Colonus, this is part of the offer Creon makes to bring Oedipus back to Thebes, um, but to let Polynices's body rot in the open. To refer to Schmidt once more, the claim is that to establish the new order, to consolidate it, in which the new modes of mourning would find their legitimacy, 
Creon feels, to, feels compelled to capture Polynices in the extra legal zone of a state of exception. In the, in the Robert Fagel's translation, Antigone calls it an emergency decree and an instance of martial law. Bonnie Honick, and um, she has a wonderful book, Antigone Interrupted, Bonnie Honick has argued that when placed in the context of the historical shift in the ideology of grief, the play can be seen to concern, quote, the substitution of logos in Periclean democracy for the beauteous bodies of Homeric epic. That is the individual heroes um, um, grieved and, and uh, um, celebrated. The question then becomes what work Polynices's rotting body does in facilitating that substitution, a substitution that authorizes the substitutability, establishes the replaceability of one citizen body for another when it comes to the defense of the state, the protection of one's true friends against enemies. When forms of life undergo major transformations, it's as if the human life form must be reborn. I think that's the stakes of Marx's notion of Gattungswesen, species um, being. In Antigone, that rebirth, along with its labor pains, gathers around Polynices's rotting remains. As Alenka emphasizes, Creon's edict prohibiting the burial or mourning of Polynices creates within the jurisdiction of the polis an extra legal, extra territorial zone in which the dead can fully die and the living can fully live. In his dialogue, um, in his dialogue with Creon, Tiresias essentially accuses the king of the paradoxical act of undeadening both the living and the dead. Quote, you have thrust to the world below a child sprung for the world above, ruthlessly lodged a living soul within the grave. Then you've robbed the gods below the earth, keeping a dead body here in the bright air, unburied, unsung, unhallowed by the rites. Alenka further argues that understanding Antigone's stance with respect to Polynices as a singular instance of rot requires that one unpack the topic of incest in the Theban plays. If I understand her correctly, and this is where I'm actually most uncertain about my understanding, um, and that's something I'd like to, to you know, discuss. Um, if I understand her correctly, for Alenka, Polynices, son and brother to Oedipus, embodies a remnant of the stakes in the incest that stains the family, a paradoxical refusal to succeed, to be subject to the law of succession of generations. Polynices's corpse figures then as something like the refuse of this refusal. But already in the political field in which the drama plays out, another aspect comes into view with respect to the crucial question as to why in her famous auto-elegiac dirge, Antigone expresses an apparent willingness to let other ostensibly replaceable family members lie exposed and rotting, but singles out her brother as worthy of burial seemingly solely on the basis of his irreplaceability. Quote, but mother and father both lost in the holes of death, no brother could ever spring to light again. The unwritten law concerning the right to have burial rights to which she had earlier appealed over against Creon's edict seem to apply to all of one's kin, or even as, as, some, as some have argued, universally to human beings as the seal of their dignity. Antigone does indeed say in her confrontation with Creon, death longs for the same rights for all. In her dirge, this law comes to be singularized, specified as applying to a single case. Surely a good part of what endows Polynices with a kind of surplus value for Antigone derives from Creon's attempt to appropriate his rotting flesh as the foundation of his own sovereignty. Creon's excessive exercise of the law in treating Polynices as a traitor and enemy concerns, as Elenka puts it, the exploitation of a corpse as a symbolic stake. His undeadening of Polynices serves, that is, as a kind of primitive accumulation of political capital. Alenka fleshes out the paradox of this mythic lawmaking violence, to use Walter Benjamin's formulations, by characterizing Creon as a last cannibal, that is, the one who ate the last one to clear the space for society of non-cannibals. As she puts it, quote, Creon stages the feast of eating the last cannibal and invites everyone to see his decaying body. 
one could almost hear Creon saying, enjoy. Antigone's response could thus be understood as saying, not with my brother, you don't. The famous appeal to unwritten laws might thus be better understood as an attempt to unwrite Creon's attempt to underwrite his authority with Polynices's rotting body. It functions as a strike aimed at Creon's act of appropriation, a strike meant to interrupt the feast. I am thinking here too of Walter Benjamin, for whom the general strike was a means of interrupting the eternally recurring feast day, festag, that had absorbed everyday life in a capitalism that had become religion. Just an aside. Calling this, call this the fundamental antagonism of the play, a singular display, one with a proper name of a structural antagonism with universal import. Though she doesn't explicitly claim it, I think that Alenka has, with her analysis of the paradox of the last cannibal and the notion of undeadness, made a major contribution to the theory of sovereignty and of its historical mutations. Michel Foucault, one will recall, characterized classical sovereignty as the power over life and death. Modern biopolitical sovereignty, he argued, involves a new relation to death and to life, one that seeks, above all, to administer, manage, and optimize life. What Alenka proposes is a different understanding of power, one that focuses neither on the threat of death nor on the optimization of life, but rather on the occupation, the besetzung, of the dimension between two deaths, control over the uncanny state of undeadness, state of undeadness. Speaking of the harsh punishment assigned to Antigone, that of being forced to live her own death, Alenka writes that, quote, not only Polynices, but Antigone also will not get a proper burial. She will be walled up in a tomb. This event becomes the central image of the play, this impossible place, this non-place between two deaths, end of quote, one that eventually claims Creon himself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a very, very, very thorough uh, reflection and response to Linka's book. Um, yes, uh, we have the next in line of speakers who is uh, Frank Gruda. Uh, please, Frank. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Milan. Thank you, Alenka, for, for doing this uh, with everyone. Um, I want to address um, three aspects, three dimensions, maybe, of Alenka's magnificent and highly highly suggest, uh, suggestive elaborations in Let Them Rot. And these are firstly um, what we could call a formal or formalizing and probably even mathematical dimension of the Sophoclean play. Secondly, I would highlight how within and through its formalization, a specific type of asymmetry appears, which seems to be the reason or cause for its peculiar or strange universal, maybe not validity, but address as a play that perpetually regains and re-emphasizes its actuality in and for times of crisis. Finally, I would like to briefly discuss the political implications of this and would like to raise the question of how we can make a move from a certain surplus that Antigone embodies, fundamentally she is more than herself, to a different practice and use of this very surplus, a more collective one maybe. So my points will be the mathematics of Antigone, the formula or formulas of antigonal asymmetry, and finally, antigonal surplus politics. They certainly have a bearing on the three main anchor points of Alenka's discussion, violence, funeral rites, and incest, but I will leave these uh, mostly implicit and rather formulate my thoughts rather from the side or as a diagonal to Alenka's own very powerful elaboration. To begin with my first point, the mathematical the formalized aspects, the mathematics of Antigone, so to speak. It is linked to a claim that Alenka makes early on in her book, notably, I cite her, that it seems that Antigone comes into focus or rewriting and interpretation every time there is some significant tectonic shift or crisis in the social fabric, unquote. Something in Antigone continues to speak to us, to speak to everyone, even though it should be entirely incomprehensible given the vast historical difference between a society um, 14, uh, 411 BCE, when it, it probably was conceived in our own times. But times of crisis bring things, Antigone and us together. 
This something that speaks to us is linked to the formal, formalizing quality of the play. It's introducing a parallax view, um, as Alenka shows, and maybe one can therefore venture calling it a parallax play. A play in which one finds a strange coincidence of what can impossibly coincide. A play in which there is more at play than the play. This is to say, on the one side, it brings to the fore a coincidence of two perspectives that cannot, for formal reasons, really meet and therefore usually don't, at least when there is no crisis of the social. The figure of Antigone in this case is a sort of paradoxical, concrete, universal of the parallax view, maybe. Uh, are we thus in the play getting and encountering the formalization of an event? A question Alenka herself raises at one point. So something impossible happening as something that therefore just became possible. And if so, what is this thing, this uh, Alenka calls it the absolute starting point at one point that makes Antigone a figure of pure desire and is embodied by her and her act of covering her dead brother's body and her demand to bury him. It seems to me that the book indicates that as much as there is applied mathematics and pure mathematics, we also can encounter in Sophocles Antigone a figure and acts of pure desire that we therefore can apply to all kinds of situations of crisis. So there's a mathematics of pure desire and um, may, maybe applied mathematics. Given the fact that the situations must be situations in and of crisis, Sophocles and Antigone mathematics is then the mathematics of a specific type of the subject or more adequately. It is because Antigone desires and acts on the ground and only on the ground of her desire, a mathematics, a formalization of subjectivization in its pure form. My second point has to do with the way in which this subjectivization is formally articulated. Since it is often in readings of the play rendered, uh, and Alenka discusses this brilliantly, as if Antigone would mainly embody a clash of two orders, the stable um, order of the law of the family and the equally stable law of the state. And in such readings, one would claim that the issue that manifests in and is embodied by Antigone is that there is no meta law that would allow us to tell which law we would be able to apply successfully. Right? I mean, so the problem would then be how to get from the pure desire to the application of it. So either <clears throat> bury the dead brother and follow the law of the family or not do it and then follow the demand of the state law, don't bury the brother. And Alenka brings out that this is a far too stabilizing and far too symmetrical reading. Antigone would then be formally uh, the embodiment of a forced free choice between two different laws for which there is no orientation provided by any law. But the problem is not simply that there are two available orientations of the same validity that enter into conflict. Rather, the state whose position Creon occupies is itself never just neutral, but is founded on a certain kind of access or arbitrariness that uh, Benjamin and Eric just referred to him would have identified as mythic lawmaking violence. And in this sense, Creon's punishment of Polynikes, the refusal of burying him and leaving his body exposed, is itself not based on a higher or different law. It's a lawless act somehow. Law is founded on lawlessness. So the action of the law embodying Creon have themselves an excessive dimension, but, and this is crucial, it is an access that is fundamentally of a different nature and fundamentally operates differently than the figure of Antigone. Um, she embodies a position that makes a difference, or more precisely, she embodies a form of difference in Alenka's formulation that makes a difference, that actually makes a difference. Whereas what uh, Creon does is normalizing the access that allows him to, um, to, to assume the position that he assumes. The difference that makes a difference is here then a difference of the two perspectives, not of family and the state, but rather of normalization and its foundation. What does this mean? In my understanding, it means at least that she is not simply in a subjective conflict as if inherently torn between two equally valid sides, but she is embodying the very access that comes to the fore because there is a crisis in the social fabric that Creon attempts to invisibilize and normalize. Put differently, if Creon embodies the state and the normalization and overcoming of what preceded it, the abyss of foundational crimes that determine the history of the actual Oedipal family and of Oedipus descendants, this very axis is embodied by Antigone in a way that does not normalize it. She refuses to normalize and thereby attempts to be and enact this very axis. This axis is in her fully subjectively assumed and brought out in the open. But it's not about this or that crime that might be foundational for the state and the system of legality and law, but it is an access that is linked to any normal social order as such, which establishes itself by means of a crime that the committing of this very crime seems to erase. 
what is the robbing of a bank in comparison to founding one, as Brecht famously noted, Antigone is debunking, maybe debanking the resulting normalcy. She insists that the impossible crime, as Alenka calls it, this strange gap that leads from committing a crime to transforming the crime into an act of constituting a system of law remains open and becomes as invisible as it is visible. There is thus, because she finds an object that embodies it, and that's her brother. There is thus a fundamental asymmetry in the antagonism of Antigone and Creon between the attempt to normalize through transforming a further atrocity into law and the emphasis that one has to bury the very terrorist who the state wants to forget for the sake of normalizing itself. She embodies the very terrorist side of the operation of the state that is usually, especially today, one could say, normalized in and through its diverse war on all kinds of terrorists. She takes on the very rotting body of her brother as a concrete universal for what can only be seen from one side of a social asymmetry, of a social antagonism, and elevates it into the pure form of what is problematic and inconsistent in the state as such. This sounds heroic, one individual against the state, and it certainly is, but Antigone, and maybe we can talk about this later a bit, is a very specific heroine, notably one that is not very sympathetic, or one that questions our very desire to be able to identify ourselves with a hero or heroine in the first place. But as I want to ask ultimately, and I'm about to end already, what does follow from this politically? And I, I was very glad that, that, that Alenka clearly pointed out in their opening remarks um, that, that in, in what way um, let's say the event of desire that 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 is Antigone um, um, can be read as a political suspension of 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 the ethical. Um, for, for at the very end of her book, Alenka relates her reading of the Antigone to our contemporary predicament and uh, present social situation. It indicates that Antigone, in the way in which she can be read as formalizing the act of subjectivizing, of hysteric subjectivization, thinking and acting from the position of the crisis of the social, is a figure of alternative futures. Her desire consistently and stubbornly is directed towards the object which embodies the inconsistency in and of the social fabric had that brother, and thus appears structurally destructive, therefore, for her and obviously for her and for the social, and she does not seem to offer any positive alternative or universe, uh, universalizer program or agenda. But uh, Alenka indicates, with reference to Slavoj's rewriting of the Antigone, a possible, um, I think, clearly uh, political reading beyond or aside from destruction. Slavoj, as Alenka reminds us, has come up with three different future of Thebes. First, Creon prevails, second, Antigone prevails, or third, the chorus intervenes and takes over. The third option is also endorsed by Alenka, and she states, I would simply add to that third option that the third collective ending or future also emerges as a possibility because of Antigone and her hysterical subjectivization, unquote. That's hysteric subjectivization first. But what does this mean for the link between, and that's the question, I mean, and that is really an open question and not, not an academic question where I'm trying to bullshit that I know something better than someone else. I, I think that is something I really would like to talk about. What does this mean for the link between historic subjectiv hysteric subjectivization and collective appropriation or collective, uh, collective takeover? For the link between hysteric subjectivization and organization, or put differently, how to organize collectively the subjectivization of a point of impossibility, or again, um, could one imagine a collective pure desire for a collective pure desire? Is that maybe something that Hegel had in mind when he spoke of a free will that wills a free will? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much. This was very dense. And uh, we have our last speaker, uh, Slavoj. The floor is yours. Okay. Since I usually talk too much, I will try to cover it all, so I will immediately begin. First, I must reiterate, Alenka, you are used to these tasteless remarks by me, reiterate my hatred of Alenka, unconditional hatred, because I thought, writing three lines of Antigone, there we are, the subject is closed, let's go to sleep. And then nobody asked her to do it, Alenka came and basically wrote a fourth version which compelled me to 
rethink everything I did on Antigone. In other words, it's difficult to say this. She is better than me here. Okay, so I will not talk in general, but focus on one specific point, which apparently has the just not too much to do with Antigone, but with uh, what Alenka hints, and it was already mentioned by some of you, is <laughs> this sense of uh, uh, eating the last cannibals again and again. And I think this is especially what we find today from Donald Trump to uh, uh, Putin in Russia and so on and so on. This totally false redefinition of courage, the courage of brutal violation of the laws, not the written, unwritten laws, but the laws in the simple sense of freedom, decency, and so on. So let me begin. The lesson of Antigone is that what characterizes an authentic emancipatory thought is not a vision of conflict-free, harmonious future, but the properly dialectical notion of antagonism. Antagonism, which is incompatible with the right-wing topic of the need for an or the need of an enemy to assert our own self-identity and uh, 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 need for an enemy means i need the other one to be annihilated so that i can be myself in proper emancipatory politics this is always accompanied by but to do this i have also to radically change even annihilate myself. Now, let me be more precise. Here is Martin Heidegger's precise articulation of the need for an enemy from his course of 1933-34, a longer quote. An enemy is each and every person who poses an essential threat to the design of the people and its individual members. The enemy does not have to be external, and the external enemy is not even always the most dangerous one. And it can seem as if there were no enemies. Then it is a fundamental requirement to find the enemy, to expose the enemy to the light, or even first to make the enemy so that the standing against the enemy may happen so that Dazan may not lose its edge. The challenge is to bring the enemy into the open, to harbor no illusions about the enemy, to keep oneself ready for attack, to cultivate and intensify a constant readiness and to prepare the attack, looking far ahead with the goal to total annihilation of the enemy, end of quote. The most ominous passage is here, passage is here of course, to expose the enemy, blah, blah, or even first to make the enemy. In short, it doesn't even matter if the enemy is a real enemy. If there is no enemy, it has to be invented so that a people may not lose its edge. And ca they can prepare the invented enemy's total annihilation. What we find here is the logic of antisemitism at its, its most elementary. What Heidegger ignores is that is the possibility that an enemy is invented to create a false unity of the people and thus cover up its immanent antagonism. Now, here is the supreme case, I think so, of such a need for an enemy in his well-known, I'm sorry if this is well-known to some of you, speech to the SS leaders in Poznan, Poznan. In, on October 4th, 1943, Heinrich Himmler spoke quite openly about the mass killing of the Jews as, 
slope, a glorious page in our history, uh, one that has never been written and can never can be written. Himmler then goes on to characterize the ability to do this and to remain distant as the greatest virtue. Quote, to have gone through this extermination of the Jews and at the same time to have remained decent, that has made us hard. What makes all this so fascinating is the high ethical language used by Himmler to justify the extermination of the Jews and the brutal treatment of the Slavic people under German occupation. Another quote, one principle must be absolute for an SS man. We must be honest, decent, loyal and friendly to members of our blood and to no one else. Whether or not 10,000 Russian women collapsed from exhaustion while digging a, a tank ditch interests me only insofar as the tank ditch is completed for Germany, end of quote. Himmler goes to the end here. Further in the speech, he imagines the case of an SS officer on the Eastern Front confronting a Russian mother with a small child, both scared of him trembling and crying. This soldier's first reaction is understandably compassion. Is, really, is it really his duty as a soldier to kill these two helpless human beings? Himmler's answer is unconditional. Yes, his fidelity is only to the German people, which implies total indifference towards the suffering of the members of other races and nations. Bearing in mind the suffering, the German people are exposed by the continuous bombing by American and British planes. Any compassion with the two poor Russians is nothing less than treason. It's an act of ignoring the suffering of one's own people. Was then Himmler a sadie doing horrible things and gaining surplus enjoyment? from his conviction that he is just doing it as an ethical duty, that he's doing it for the big other, for the good of the German nation. I think this formula is too simple. There is something much more horrifying in Himmler. From what one can see by way of reading his letters, he was much more than Eichmann a terribly normal person. He detested personally uh, witnessing any brutality. He was decent and kind to his friends, ready to punish SS members even for their petty crimes. And as such, as a normal individual, he did in his office what we know he did, what we know he did. It is here that Lacan's claim that normality is a form of psychosis acquires its uh, weight. Now, what lurks behind this topic is the question of the big other. The conclusion that imposes itself is not that every ethical stance needs some figure of the big other to rely on, but on the contrary, that a truly radical ethical position emerges when the subject is deprived of the support in a big other, so that it has to make a decision in the abyss of its, his, her, their freedom. Such a decision stands for the moment when, as already Alenka reminded us, when ethics gets political, for the moment of the political suspension of the ethical. The subject has to make a decision which cannot be fully grounded in any kind of higher neutral principles, like don't do to others what you wouldn't like them to do to you, and so on. It has to make a decision about how to apply these principles, a decision which always gives them a particular spin. And this is, I think, the case for Antigone. 
her decision to risk everything for the proper funeral of her brother cannot be fully grounded in the universal immemorial rules she evokes. She picked out her brother, ignoring all others, and it is this restriction which makes her act political, not just her public appearance. One should critically note that even the redust deconstruction continues to rely on a figure of the big other. When Derrida writes that deconstruction is justice, an impossible justice, but still justice, this determination implies that deconstruction does not just bring out the inconsistencies and contradictions of a text or of a reality. The work of deconstruction is led by the impossible idea of fully bringing out all inconsistencies which legitimize secret forms of domination and oppression. This goal is, of course, infinitely postponed, forever eluding, in the same sense that Derrida talks about democracy to come. Justice is always to come. To claim that it is fully here would have been the worst case of metaphysics of presence. However, in spite of the impossibility that pertains to justice, we have to cling to it as the kind of regulative ideal. I remember talking to a faithful Deridean years ago at the reception after the talk. I can tell you now this was Avital Ronel. And while we were picking up pieces of fried chicken, she told me, how will we justify doing this at the final Nuremberg trial for the crimes human committed against animals. The relative idea here is that an ethical debt is accumulating for all the horrors of the industrial breeding of animals. Just think what we are doing to millions of pigs, which remain half blind and barely can walk. They are just bred to get enough to get fed enough as quickly as possible and be slaughtered for our consumption. Now, I respectfully remain silent to Avital's remark, but the idea of a gigantic trial of all humanity, by whom, struck me as strangely twisted. Do we really have to presuppose such a figure of the big other, a promise that at some final point, all depths will be settled, although we know this moment will never arrive, is such an idea not deeply anthropocentric, transposing onto the stupid indifference of nature a sense of justice totally absent in it? Cannot we act ethically also without such a figure of the big other? Back to Himmler. Do we, all of humanity, not treat animals in exactly the same way Hitler demanded Germans to treat Russian women. Whether or not 10,000 uh, pigs collect from exhaustion of being overfed and treated with hormonal chemicals with no, uh, uh, with no free movement in nature, this interests us only insofar as the quota of pork meat is completed for us humans. So when Himmler said that Holocaust is a glorious page in our history, and one that has never been written and never can be written, it doesn't only mean that the extermination of the Jews should not be known to the general public. It's interesting, and I'm not a partisan of David Irving. Here he 5% convinced me, namely what? That Himmler also meant Hitler himself, the Messiah, Himmler's term, leading, leading the German nation to a new beginning. The true fidelity to the Messiah, the true courage, is that we do silently and secretly the necessary dirty work of clearing the ground so that Hitler will be able to realize his grandiose vision. 
The great act of us, close followers of the Messiah, is to keep him, the leader, in ignorance, to allow him to pursue his vision in some kind of blessed innocence. As a supreme self-sacrifice, Himmler takes upon himself the evil, and this properly ethical evil makes him much worse than any form of pragmatic opportunism. Here, in this, I'm at the end, in this perfect interpretation, here I see today's crayon in figures, again, from Putin Trump to their followers, who, one cannot use another name here, who, in order to obfuscate social antagonism, uh, in some sense, act in a radical ethical way. They followed principle, principle, what's the best for their people and so on, independently of their, of their independently of their uh, 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 of their uh, private profit and so on and so on. Again, think of Himmler. He, some essay lower officers were third and uh, one or two rings from the Jews were found in their pocket. They were shot. They were not thought for killing, torturing uh, mothers, uh, small girls, and so on. They were shot from this. And I think that this false courage, this idea of ignoring uh, suffering of ordinary people, not only this, but to define true courage, uh, courage sorry, precisely as the courage to, to spend your, I don't like these terms, but I will use them naively, to overcome, to leave behind your elementary ethical sense of compassion and so on. This is the ethics which is massively returning today. And that's why I agree with Alenka, just a brief ending. That's why uh, Antigone is causing so much trouble today. For example, just to conclude, with my friend Udi Aloni, I was once, I think it was in Ramallah, debating with some Palestinians, friends of Aloni, who stayed there in Benin, they moved to Ramallah, uh, Antigone, but in, uh, 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 in, uh, in a modernized version. Creoni's father, uh, 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 Antigone is a member of a big Palestinian family. Her brother is shot by the Israelis as a terrorist, and Israel prohibits its uh, proper funeral. Antigone defies it and organizes a proper burial. And then I exploded. I said, sorry, you got it wrong. The proper version would have been, imagine a big Palestinian family, they still exist there with father of the family, that would be a crayon. And then they, one of their brothers of Antigone, one of the children is shot as a terrorist. And Antigone insists we should bury him also properly and the conflict is there. And the reaction of my good friends otherwise there was incredible. All of a sudden, they, big fighters for the freedom of Palestine, began to speak like crayon. They told me, wait a minute, we are talking here about Antigone, noble struggle for freedom and so on and so on. Who cares about the kitty traitor and so on? It's incredible how People even today massively avoid this. And that, let's say I begin the discussion so that I will be done and then. This is what I found infinitely refreshing in Alenka's book, but also what I learned from Mladen. Everything has to be rethought about Antigone and Oedipus as such. As Antigone, uh, uh, I wanted to say Antigone, as Alenka and Mladen pointed out, 
All this Hegelian stuff, a pseudo-Freudian reading, you know. Oedipus unconsciously killed uh, his father, murdered his mother, uh, uh, sorry, the other way around, uh, killed his father, married his mother, and uh, then he kills, uh, he blinds himself because he cannot withstand the horror of what he did, which was his unconscious desire, and so on and so on. I was shocked how enlightening Alenka and Mladen were to me, where they both point out, my God, read King Oedipus, read Antigone. What you find there is that at the end of King Oedipus already, Oedipus does not admit, yeah, unconscious guilt and so on. No, he insists to the end. I didn't know who they were. I am not guilty. That's why for me, the ultimate Oedipus is Oedipus at Colonus. And I will conclude with this joke reported by Alenka uh, to solicit you to read her book. Uh, Alenka found a passage in Oedipus at Colonus where Oedipus speaks like a tricky American lawyer. He says, look, I was at a crossing, a big man attacked me. What should I have done? Should I, before defending myself, tell him, sorry, guys, just for a second, are you sure you are not my father, that then I can attack you? And in her vicious femininity, the greatest compliment that I can give to, to Alenka, she then provides a, 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 a sexual version of this and said that Oedipus could have said, listen, you flirt with a woman and then you want to go to bed and what should you do then? Tell her, sorry, but just we go to bed. Are you sure you are not my mother or whatever? No, Oedipus is not guilty. For me, the happiest play of the trilogy is Oedipus at Colonus. I follow here Mladen, who developed this, where Oedipus is a happy person in the sense of he finally found his desire, how to hurt his pity and evil desire, but he perfectly knows what he wants, he, he is a happy hero. It's if there ever is a happy ending in drama, it's Oedipus at Colonus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Slavoj. Well, we had uh, Lenka's presentation, four contributions, very rich contributions, pointing in so many different directions. I, I really don't know how to proceed from there. Um, I will first give the word to Alenka to, I mean, I know Alenka, you're in a very difficult position. You, you, you're not, um, you're not to re respond to everything. Just pick out some things you think are interesting or have an immediate idea about. Uh, we shouldn't burden you in this way that you, you are the general responder to all kinds of questions. It's impossible. Yeah, thank you, Mladen. Uh, yeah, of course, it's impossible. So anyway, I will do the, not the impossible, but just uh, say a couple of things which surely will, will not do justice to, to these uh, comments and remarks and questions, which really, for which I really uh, thank you. And this is not just a form of politeness. I really uh, appreciate the, the engagement and the seriousness of this uh, all these ideas and also um, their whatever they are really extremely productive also for uh, what I'm doing uh, right now and what I will probably continue to do. So just very briefly, if I start with uh, some things that uh, Chris uh, um, mentioned and uh, uh, his question, which was basically about the 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 effects, the the feelings, and so on. Uh, Perhaps, I don't know, I would say that it it could be that my uh, take on Antigone, my reading of Antigone is here uh, kind of heavily influenced by certain things that um, Lacan said about this precisely in the seminar seven, uh, the ethics of psychoanalysis in which uh, would in a way, I mean, he doesn't say this, but I would almost put it like this, could desire actually not exactly on an on the opposite end of the, an affect, but something that desire is not exactly an affect in the sense in which we nowadays kind of uh, talk about uh, affect in terms of feelings. And so, uh, okay, Lacan um, 
kind of um, they found this on several things in the play, um, including these um, designations of Antigone precisely as cold and um, kind of uh, uh, precisely not uh, having any feelings of this kind. He also relates this to the whole uh, Aristotelian notion of catharsis as something that tragedy is supposed to do that is precisely to kind of cure us of certain feelings to, to kind of transpose feelings into something else and so on. So uh, I think uh, there is, I mean, it's obviously that there is this um, coldness or this certain kind of a strange, uh, yeah, thing that everybody notices in uh, also the protagonists of the play uh, in respect to, to Antigone, uh, which resonates um, with something which doesn't, yeah, kind of really enter this question or is not she seems not to be driven by feelings let me put it like this so you ask this question what actually drives her what is this thing i, I guess it was you who asked this question so uh, my response would be to some extent i would repeat what i say in um in the book, namely that this is precisely one point where the it's not only about the question of Antigone, but where is the question of the enigma of desire that she uh, poses for us, that we have to answer this question for ourselves, or she and she makes everybody in the play actually kind of answer it. So it's not simply the question of what does she want, but the fact that we are asking this question all the time, what does she want, what drives her, is actually precisely how he kind of does manage to, 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 to produce this uh, um, dimension of, uh, of desire and its interrogation also in ourselves. Now, okay, the whole question of lament and also is this a complaint is the lament exactly a complaint perhaps uh it's also uh some time ago i mean this was still in the ethics of the, the real book i actually tried to read this lament in the way in which um one talks about the, inf uh, the 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 final judgment in the sense of something that puts an end or kind of totalizes something that could not be totalized but goes on forever you know this kind of bad infinity okay if she would uh, go on living she would be married she would have children she would do this and that and that she would have normal life uh, and then she kind of puts herself uh, at that final point uh, and it is from that final point where life can only be seen as already lost that she kind of utters this lament. So I think it's also a kind of structural um, question, and this is another difficult question of what Lacan calls realization of desire, how to realize desire in the end. But okay, this would uh, bring us perhaps too far. Perhaps one other just uh, comment about the question of life and death. And is this mini the one who is kind of um, representing Clive and Antigone more kind of inclined, as you put it, uh, toward death. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, here we, we like to complicate this history of the dead, the story of the dead drive precisely by saying that uh, if anything really drives life, it is the dead drive. <laughs> it is not simply some um, whatever instinct of survival or some kind of so, uh, and the, 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 this surplus that drives life could be to some extent formalized or of, uh, conceptualized precisely as this is dead drive within life itself. So here, again, there is this thing that Antigone is, that she is precisely um, um, the figure um, which very early in the history of uh, literature, whatever, kind of really confronts us with this uh, life and that uh, a limit of something that is much more complicated anyway. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, perhaps this would be my, uh, and also just one more point, that there is this interesting passage and you surely will know what is the Greek term. I don't remember now, but even though, okay, she's more like, towards that, you, as you put it, and uh, the Ismini uh, kind of more, 
clone life, so to put it, but there is also this famous passage where Antigone says that she's doing this out of love or something like this. I'm not sure if the term she uses is, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I don't know right now, but there is this uh, sentence which is also often commented on where she brings in love as the reason for her, as that what drives her. Obviously, this couldn't be then question, is this love for Polynesia's life in general? Love? But still, it's not. I think it's something that also perhaps complicates a little bit uh, this question of uh, life and death. And can one really be driven by love if one is not also, to some extent, does not answer the, this uh, whatever logic or dialectic or whatever of of the drive and the okay these are some very scattering uh, perhaps um, remarks um, that our associations more like that I had very uh, sporadically when I was uh, listening to your questions and comments, Chris, for which I. Uh, I really uh, thank you. But for this question of Hamon and his political role, yeah, perhaps we should, uh, I would need to uh, to think of it a little bit more. I haven't at all. It always uh, gets left out. I'm just very curious. Yeah, about yeah, that, yeah. I, the, but it's, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I, may I just say one word very quickly, I'm allowed, and I hope I'm not violating here. Um, I, I one of the things that really struck me as you were uh, working through the, the, the some theoretical questions here, particularly with regard to language and the real uh, and the corpse and so forth, uh, I, I find it utterly compelling. And um, it's also struck me constantly how Blanchotian this is, <laughs> and uh, in, in Lacan's reading, Lacan's drawing heavily from Blanchot. It seems to me, and including uh, the relation of uh, um, the relation to Jocasta, and the desire uh, that's being defined of with the mother, yeah, mother's, yeah. mother's desires, and uh, that's a that's a Blanchotian motif that um, uh, is 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 fascinating. And I'm I've, I've I want to always I keep hoping I have so many Lacanians in this group. Maybe somebody can tell me something about Lacan and Blanchot that I don't know because I have some deep suspicions that that relation was closer than people are, are uh, know. But that said, the only reason I, I was talking about affect is that in you take a, a text like the, uh, the Step Not Beyond, Le Pas Au-delà, or also the writing of the disaster. Blanchot is, is starting to, in, in the whole second half of, of Le Pas Au-delà, he starts talking about what I call the passions of finitude. And those are uh, malheur, uh, angst, uh, or, or angoisse, and uh, la peur, fear. And um, in each case, he's saying this is a relation to death. Um, uh, where where we are in a, a, a kind of this kind of other relation that you were starting to talk about with regard to you know outside the symbolic, and so um, I was thinking that can we possibly think of of uh, uh, Antigone's philia in this sense? Um, is her philia uh, 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 of the order of a passion um, that would be linked to what 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 Blanchot is describing, and uh, that was that's the what, that's what I, I I left that part out. I'm sorry, I was trying to say so much in so little time, but um, that that's what I meant by affect because I do completely agree, you know, with what you're saying about the relation between desire and affect and how Lacan is reading that. But I just wondered whether this couldn't be this question couldn't be renewed in some sense with respect to that Blanchotian um, insight. That's just to explain where I was coming from. Thank you very much, Alinka. Thank you. So, so perhaps I don't know. I will. I have to move on so that there is some time left. Too, yes, but I, I think this question of Blanc yes. Lacan is. I think there's somebody even answered in here that he's mentioned twice in Lacan. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I don't know if there were. I mean, if there is any story of there. But it is. I mean, I, I sense just to make this one quick point. I sense this. You know, when you talk about passions to finitude and this kind of also, let's say, Heideggerian. Um, part of precisely uh, passions are something that is related to this being toward death, uh, Heideggerian, I really, I kind of try to argue both in the sex book and here uh, how this, how in Lacan you have, Lacan you have a, slight, a slightly different way of this and the, 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 the this passion, uh, the, uh, finally it's not so much of finitude but precisely of something infinite that won't go away, that would 
simply you know, be there. So it's, uh, but anyway, th this is a different discussion and uh, probably a very necessary one, which we can have perhaps also at uh, at some other occasion in Sasfi, perhaps not this, uh, this uh, um, summer. Uh, so, okay, Eric, thank you so much. I mean, this was so beautifully put. I, I don't really... Uh, know what, what to say except that it uh, uh, it captured I think at least one never knows what one writes and what is the effect of, of what one writes but still it really captured uh, very I think beautifully and very correctly uh, the, all the main points actually of this uh, essay and I also and I like so much this formulation did you say primitive accumulation of yeah. political capital or uh, uh, yeah yes. yeah yeah. which I, I really think this is kind of a extremely good way of putting what I was um, yeah, trying to articulate with this question of the corpse which would not uh, which uh, Antigone refuses or as you uh, put it also but not with my brother so like, enjoy this uh, we, we have so uh, and I think the and the, the whole way in which this formulation of primitive accumulation precisely links this to the to the whole Marxian uh, topics here and also the, the case it's, it's I think it's extremely important um, precisely because as several of you uh, emphasized. Uh, I also <clears throat> really argue that there is there is this double level. There is this, let's say, foundational crime as also uh, Fra to which also Frank related. It is uh, inherent to to all, let's say, normal law, which can is part based on this cannibal joke. We have we are no cannibals. We ate the last one yesterday, uh, but then there is also this uh, quite additional uh, surplus what uh, Creoner, perhaps not everyone else does with this corpse, um, invites everyone to, to feast to it or, or using it as a kind of special weapon, secret weapon to be mobilized precisely in this kind of attempt to libidinalize the, 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 the social tissue, which is yes. another way of what we call today populist uh, uh, or, or whatever ways of uh, governing of, of everything power. So I really, uh, I really, really like this. And uh, okay, you, you say that uh, you there was a question whether you understood incest correctly. I think yes. you, you did. Uh, I mean, I, I think I, I kind of noticed this even kind of post facetum retroactively while I was kind of rereading uh, my book that actually there is this kind of almost identical question paradox structure whatever that is being repeated in all three chapters which starts with this uh, whatever cannibal slippage what is lost there and what then uh, re um, reappears in this form and then uh, I pursue it in a slightly different way from this question of bur burial rights and then undeadness and then is what is the, uh, the, the, the the cut in the life that is assured its continuation and so on and of course incest it has a slightly similar structure at least to one to some extent because the, there is this kind of impossible missing link between nature and culture uh, which I also read this is just one segment of my reading which is the very reason for the incest taboo because this incest is in itself impossible I mean there is no copulation between nature and culture in this uh, the, the direct sense, or it is precisely the, the the monstrous other side of the of the symbolic as such. So it's uh, uh, so yeah. I, I I think the and then the of course I also cannot but uh, very much uh, agree with uh, all these terms. Uh, Antigonism, which you introduced uh, in your text on uh, this Hitler and Film aus Deutschland, uh, and also, yeah, I, I just remembered after I uh, I read um, um, wrote this book that in your uh, text on Moses uh, you actually discussed this last cannibal joke uh, in the context uh, there, also uh, calling it this last cannibal syndrome and so on. So it's uh, um, that the there is this question of uh, the, of a certain 
ways in which power tries to occupy the very place between two decks, not simply biopolitics of life or um, um, necropolitics also of that, but also perhaps especially this kind of uh, surplus governing of this thing, which also I think is an idea that you developed in, in your um, books uh, already. So um, yeah, thank you uh, for, for these remarks. Uh, so as, as to Frank and your uh, comments, uh, yeah, I, I, I again, I cannot agree more than, I mean, this asymmetry that you bring out and that you uh, started with, um, with this question of this, let's say, Antigone surplus, and then a question whether there is a, a surplus politics, of surplus politics or kind of collective that, that would uh, functions that would not be simply Antigone, but something that is a different way of uh, politicizing this uh, surplus or, or working word with it or organizing it. If I understood correctly what you said, so uh, I think uh, this question of Antigone and on the one hand and collective on the other hand is obviously a big question that kind of lures um behind uh, many of our present and i mean on in this moment but also in general political discussions because also obviously one of the uh, reproaches to antigone is precisely that this is a kind of isolated uh, individualist highly subjective act that uh, has no further collective um uh, perhaps uh, uh, effects or consequences uh but as you you i think in your presentation you also tried to kind of precisely show how this is not necessarily the case and how and this is perhaps one way of uh, understanding the term parallax also in the book that the, the, the these two dimensions need to be taken together it's not that you have either antigone or you have the collective or you have this way of uh working or or, or you have the collective but that there is something some if you want antigonal um surplus with which, which is within the collective which is precisely it's uh it could be its political uh point its political core so to say uh but again okay this is uh and this is very uh, abstract. Now, more concretely, I really think that um, this, what you first said, and then Slavoj also came to this, uh, I mean, introduced this, uh, worked with this notion of normalization, that, 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 that this is really, I think, very good way of putting the, the asymmetry also between Creon who uh, produces and wants to normalize this uh, this access and Antigone who precisely refuses to to do so and to, which also means refuses is it to be used precisely or misused in this kind of a political feast of this or that enjoyment that could um, kind of consolidate a collective okay we have different kinds of collectives but there are certainly collectives that do that are formed precisely around this kind of uh, um, uh, feast or enjoyment of of a certain uh, surplus uh, so uh, and i think that this distinction is again the 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 extremely uh, precise and uh, good way of uh, formulating what is at stake uh, there um so yeah in political yeah so the political implication huh, and one more remark uh, uh you, you said you know hysterical subjectivation first i mean again we come back to this question of this act or this antigone point and the collective uh so and i actually do wonder um on the one hand we can uh, put this terms in a kind of uh, uh, dialectical way, like when Lacan, for instance, talks about the analytical discourse or the analytical uh, process, and he says that at the, the beginning of any analysis, in order for analysis to get off the uh, to start at all, there is this need for the historization of the subject. 
be whatever sex, but there is first step is necessarily a historization. Only then the work begins. This is there that the work of the unconscious, if you want political work, whatever, begins. You cannot avoid this. So yeah, historization first. But I think there is also perhaps a kind of uh, historical uh, or more concrete depending on our historical configuration necessity in this, which I would re, um, uh, kind of explain or justify this need uh, by what I diagnose as a kind of numbness of desire uh, related to, 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 the, to what I recognize as a kind of perverse structure of uh, uh, of contemporary society uh, and perversion here is very different from desire and uh, I think it is a kind of disavowal of desire in this sense and I think there is this uh, numbness of desire which is also very much part and makes a tissue of our uh, social social climate and uh, it is something that uh, I and I, I think I noticed Alicia yeah I see Alicia in the uh, in the audience, uh, she has this formulation uh, that perhaps what we are living today, I mean, the, the general state uh, is the, an ordinary perversion. No? Not so, uh, so it, there is this kind of not perversion in any kind of sense of this uh, Sadian images of whatever, but this kind of the, uh, perversion turned ordinary, but at the same time, really kind of neutralizing, numbing the uh the 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 what okay what is the desire so i think uh it's uh, perhaps the the historization could be both a kind of uh structural necessity as well as a kind of historical necessity uh in certain uh, circumstances which i think are not really um um, opened or uh, kind of susceptible to desire, uh, except in this kind of really empty hysterical theory, theater, because this also exists, obviously, but not in any consequential sense or any radical meaning of desire. Uh, yeah, and I think we could relate to this to Hegel. I mean, thank you for this final. <laughs> it's, uh, okay, Slavo, uh, I, I guess, I mean, uh, we, we we really agree uh, on all these points, and I think uh, the, this example that you developed uh, through Heidegger and particularly uh, Himmler and this kind of um, profile of uh, many contemporary uh, uh, leaders um, is extremely, extremely not only accurate, but also very important to, to kind of spell out. Uh, and again, uh, I think it's extremely important what you say that Himmler was this kind of a um, norm, uh, normality, uh, person of extreme normality, that there is this question of normalcy that already Frank uh, brought up, uh, normalcy, and which is actually now also a word that is extremely popular or at least very frequent very much in the air ever since the the, the COVID crisis or whatever is normalization getting back to normal i mean we are all with just kind of talking about crises and getting back to normal or normalizations and so on and nobody wants to or has to remain unnormal a little bit or kind of in this I think it's precisely normality is perhaps more much much um, more uh, problematic uh, notion and much more uh, I mean we can understand that in after wars and uh, crises as people want some normal life but this is not what this notion of normality uh, wants to be it wants to be precisely something that obfuscates uh, this antagonism that, that bring up or produce these crises to begin with. So uh, I think this is uh, what the, the, and the other thing that Slava very uh, importantly uh, said was that, uh, so it is not only exposing of the contradictions uh, of certain social order or whatever, but also this act or this decision uh, how to apply whatever 
ethical or other principles you have. So this decision, which cannot be simply uh, grounded in the big other, but in the, this decision is precisely, I think, what perhaps makes the difference between simply this kind of, let's say, um, empty theater of protesting and, uh, and a kind of more consequential uh, act of desire, which is not simply embodying the contradictions, but also a certain decision taken, not about embodying them, first of all, but also about uh, something in this. So uh, I guess this is very important, again, because it's not, uh, um, uh, it's not simply, uh, yeah, it, it is very often precisely this kind of action, and this is the case in Antigone, which is not grounded in some, and Oedipus is in the similar situation to some extent, which is not granted or kind of uh, uh, given a preemptive guarantee in the big other that is often viewed as kind of evil act, like formally evil, because it is outside of what we perceive as norms and so on. But this evil, and this is the last point that I will make, is to be differentiated from this ethical evil that uh, Slavoj um, described in relationship to, to these uh, leaders who kind of are prepared uh, ethically claim that they are, I mean, that there is this ethical stance, we are ready to do all the dirty job in order to clear the, 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 the floor or whatever the, the, the social space for the leaders and their their ideas. Uh, this kind of, because this evil is precisely, it is empirical evil, we are ready to kill people to do this and that, it is necessary uh, for the for the cause that uh, the, our leaders or whatever are representing. And this, uh, and this I really think is, and I agree here, it is much more evil than the pragmatism of, okay, let's, uh, uh, compromise and do this or that. Uh, but again, this uh, uh, other evil, with, which is a properly different kind of ethical evil, it's the act that risks this uh, step, which is not covered directly by the existing uh, big other. So, and I think just, and I will conclude with this, I was just reminded, I don't know what are your thoughts on this, I'm bringing this in just as a kind of association, but there is this interesting theme in the air also in popular uh, TV series and movies and so on. Uh, this theme also, which is perhaps not reducible to uh, uh, to this ethical evil that uh, Slavo was mentioning, but this idea that there is a certain that in name to, to how to put it uh, that actually it is ethical to do some extreme positive evil like kill people and so on in the name of loyalty to to some i mean uh, for me this was kind of uh, striking or kind of uh, uh, unsettling perhaps uh, uh, dimension of this uh, series the last of us you probably seen it it's uh, around with this kind of uh, is a uh, this perhaps would be my question to Slava. Is this something completely different or is it another way of this ethical evil, that evil that is nevertheless, or is it something that is just um, opening up or promulgating a very, very different structure precisely of deciding when, when the, the, the big other is no longer uh, there or that cannot guarantee what... Uh, is the right way to to proceed to do okay um uh, i'm sorry if this was uh, a little bit chaotic uh, but um uh, i will stop now so that uh, if you would like to say something more else that we still have some time uh, can i just can i say can i say something yeah first uh, I, I would like really alenka thank you you did the impossible uh, the impossible thing which is to respond in a very lucid way to, to most of the concerns that were raised. Uh, we really put you in, a, in an impossible situation. Uh, I'm sorry, but this, this was very illuminating. And so the, it, at this point, we reached the end of the structured kind of thing that we planned, and we are almost, uh, this is almost two hours. So now it's the, 
the non-scheduled uh, discussion is there. And uh, first, okay, I give the word to Slava to... Yeah, I will be, don't be afraid, I've spoken enough, I will be very short. First, now comes the difficult part. Alenka, these are, for me, much more serious, difficult questions I want to provoke you. In another text that you recently wrote uh, uh, about... Uh, uh, about Afro-pessimism, uh, history, history, and so on. I, can we maybe in this way imagine an answer to Frank's question about political and so on? I noticed something that you probably also noticed, just didn't have the time to write it. You know, you quote that formula of Lacan, I demand you what? to yeah, yeah. reject what I offer you, because this is not that. And, but I noticed something. I just want your thoughts on it, because I'm sure you noticed it also. But uh, in your reading, you, in an, it's an excellent reading, you apply this to more than oppressed, ex foreclosed, whatever, at, let's say African-Americans, who are bombarded by guilty liberals' offers. We give you this right, we give you that right, blah, blah, blah. And the answer should be to insist in this hysteria. No, they, this is not that. This is not that. And again, it doesn't mean give me everything infinitely. It means you. Those who are hegemonic must radically change your subjective position. It's about your being, not about what you give us. But what I find in Lacan's statement is it can be read as the statement from the other side. And this would perhaps have been, for me, a good power. A power, liberal, you, but then the power says to you, as in Lacan, I'm giving you all these rights, blah, blah, but please don't accept them. Be aware that they are not that. The power, hysterical power, which admits this. No, I will not take care of you and so on. Another question, even more evil. Uh, you wrote, I envy you again, an excellent interpretation years ago of Signe de Cufontaine comparing her dying act with Antigone, and do I remember it correctly, that there you kind of uh, oppose them along the lines that uh, there is still a certain noble beauty, even Lacan used consciously this contradictory term, uh, 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 sublime beauty, while uh, Signe is beyond that. So do you see any political or ethical potential in Sinia which goes beyond uh, Antigone? The last answer, and then I stop, to your question about the last of us, first, let's be frank. With all limitations, for one reason only, I like the series. You remember, was it episode five or what? Where they go into a community where the hero's brother lives and they're surprised how they function, no private property. And then was it the hero who says, but you live in communism. And then the guy says, yes, we live in communism. For that reason alone, I love that series. My, just to answer your question, I don't know, I will make again a crazy risky movement. Although it appears extremely egotistic what the hero does, he doesn't want to sacrifice the girl. He, he, I think it's <laughs> wrong to read it as a simple yeah. personal egotism. Yeah. I think even from the standpoint of collective, his act is the right one. Yeah, no, I, I actually think, and this was also my um, kind of reflection, that uh, what I really liked about this ending is that there was no, uh, that they didn't go in this uh, direction of sacrifice, which was actually 
calling for it to be used, you know, like finally. And, and this, I think it's an extremely strong uh, um, movement within, yeah. So uh, anyway, but this perhaps we can, uh, because it's really uh, an intriguing series. So perhaps we could uh, also do uh, this discussion at some uh, other point. But yeah, I, I don't know, you're, um, the question of Antigone and Senia de Fontaine, and this is also something that, as I said, I am kind of um, uh, returning to in the sense of kind of rethinking and rewriting. Is it? Um, uh, I definitely think there is uh, the, the, the Senia de Fontaine is also this extremely important figure here. But what I try to do now is uh, to kind of. Uh, think them uh, more together and not so much in the sense of uh, like what I still formulated then, uh, like passage from uh, desire to drive, but kind of, uh, uh, but okay, this is just program now for now, how to, to, to theorize this in the way that uh, desire and drive are both kept in the same field at the same time. And well, uh, I don't know, it, it, I think it's, there is this very interesting uh, uh, passage where, where Lacan says that the, the object of desire is the object of the drive, and they, they both circulate about it. Anyway, but this would need to be developed. I don't, I'm not kind of trying to say, okay, now let's move from drive to desire. Or, uh, there is this surplus um, tick that is there in Antig uh, in uh, Sinia, which I think is, as I put it there, extremely modern and in which kind of resonates this here today resonates with Brecht and some other stuff so uh, I definitely think there is something that happens there that uh, I, I'm just not sure if I, I would say it goes uh, even further or it is uh, I, I, I'm really hesitating here but definitely it does open this question of uh, what happens when for instance, the, the the very absolute condition of your desire collapses because this mm. uh, this happens and this happens to to Sine de Kufutain. But does it mean that you you desire can reinvent itself as in a, or or it's uh, uh, in a different way uh, or not? So, uh, but uh, these are precisely. I, I'm sorry that I don't have a more. Um, no, I don't, Precise answer, but uh, I'm really working precisely on these questions now. Well, kind of uh, trying to figure out how uh, these two things work. Uh, one sentence, please, Gladden. Half a minute. I think I have here a, a solution. Would you find this at least productive? I have a crazy idea how Antigone maybe could be put in a position to make it like uh, uh, Sinia. What if Creon, and it's strange to me, I always identify with terrorist masters. If I were to be Creon, I would say, don't think about killing Antigone on what? Lock her in some room and keep them, keep her there till she comes to her senses. Nobody is to be killed, you isolate her. And maybe Antigone in this total impotence locked there would begin to be doing some of these senior things. But you know what? Creon actually does this precisely. This, this is his intention. And she kind of spoils his claim, uh, his uh, plan by hanging herself. Because he had, there is a line in the play when he says, yeah. okay, just uh, close her, okay, in this time, but still just close the, and leave her just enough food that she won't die. Uh, and so nobody will be able to say that we killed her or whatever. You know that there is there is actually this idea, and then she. This is why she she commit. I mean, why she she kind of refuses this game or doesn't. Uh, uh, so yeah. Yes. Um, at this point, we are already working overtime. So um, please, the um, Frank Eric. Chris, do you have some additional areas? Yeah, I mean, just a, a, a brief line. Um, in one of the translations, I think it's the Green Lattimore translation, in the dialogue between um, Creon, Ismene, and Antigone, <clears throat> um, at some point, Creon says, I think it's directed to Ismene, but it could be also you know, directed to uh, Antigone. In, in the Fagel's translation, it's enough, enough, you and your talk of marriage. 
But in the Green Lattimore translation, is there is too much of you. <laughs> and this is a nice, that, that, super that, that just captures everything. Extremely nice. <laughs> yeah. And just another thought, um, Slava, you know, what, what about um, the comedy after the three versions called The Century? That is the, the poor guy who has to bring the bad news. It's almost like like seeing the entire play from the perspective of of that poor guy who just wants to get out of the machinations of power, doesn't want to have to you know, you know, be the bad messenger. Or bring, the messenger who brings the bad news. It almost seems like that would be, you know, the the name of the comedy to follow the the three tragedies. I mean, if I can very quickly right. say just. just just, just, just one thing. Um, I think, I mean, the the heart of the answer you gave earlier to to Eric, um, where you said that power tries to occupy the place between two deaths, um, right? Um, and I mean that that has immense consequences for the concept of normalization immediately. I think, right? I mean, because from there one can conceive of what Slavoj just just a moment uh, ago pointed out. Um, even of a mode of hysterical power, right? That that sort of says, well, we give you certain rights, but don't expect you can use them in the way in which they're granted to you. So there is something like, I mean, it made me make me think. It, it changes totally the theory. But Jürgen Link, the German uh, literary theorist, wrote a book called. Um, um, theory of flexible normalization. That is so flexible, right? It, 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 it is hardly describable as normalization anymore. But, right, I mean, because it, it seems to be almost um, a, to appropriate a problematic form of historicization, so to speak, um, to normalize. Um, if I understood Slavo's point correctly, that, that seems to be an interesting, interesting way, which has a lot of bearing on all kinds of Things that I mean, you guys have worked on the obscene masters or whatsoever, and and I, I think I mean, as you know, I, I had this obsession with with that figure in 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 Foucault, where he basically says right that the infamy of sovereignty appears at the at the at the limit points of the social right in the in the um, um, in, in 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 exclusion, but sovereignty itself has this infamous like an infamy quality right, um, and 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 there. And that seems to be a really important um, 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 way of critiquing contemporary forms of, well, I mean, what Foucault calls grotesque sovereigns or, what, or obscene masters, um, if I understand correctly. Yes. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I just say one more thing? Yes, um, sure, sure. One of the topics that, that's crucial in your book um, Alenka, that we didn't talk about was the status of enigmas. And you quote this central, you know, this crucial passage in Lacan, you know, he says, an enigma is most likely an, that an another is. Another is, I charge you with the task of making it into a statement. Um, and in a certain sense, I think this gets to the problem of, of um, you know, the, is it desire or is it drive? Um, my sense is that one has to imagine what Freud theorized as er erogenous zones and partial partial drives them as sphincters. That is, you know, it's like there are these the, these parts of our body that get charged, overcharged with enigmas, and there's a point at which, like the like the object A, you know, is both of it, it it it's somehow this caught between bodily you know um you know the somatic and the the solving of an enigma the um you know the the answering you know discharging the charge of the enigma and so libidinization of power is always in some sense they've got you by the sphincters mm -hmm. and in a certain sense it's Get off my sphincters, sphincters. <laughs> um, and it's almost like when when Trump said I could grab you know women by the pussy, in a certain sense he grabbed every he grabbed his base by the sphincters. You know, um, you know I have the answer to the. I mean, and I think that there's some way in which linking the you know the the body, the the you know the uh, the sexualized body, enigmas. And power 
could somehow get linked up through this thinking of that the riddles, the enigmas, um, you know, injected, you know, into the body create the stuff that power then grabs. Um, you know, thank, thanks a lot for this. I, I think, I mean, I have two further associations here. Okay, the, there is this Laplacian theory of right. enigmatic messages, which is the very kind of uh, central for his, how uh, unconscious is constituted, constituted precisely as this. But then there is also this, uh, the, the, the way I use this dimension of the enigma in the book, uh, that precise point is also related to what, what Slava was talking about, namely this kind of a, uh, a decision this, that you take without having the guarantee that you have the correct answer. So that there is, um, you, yeah, you invest, but it, it's so that there, you invest your work, so to say, and with your words, I guess you also invest your body, but you can be taken for your word. So there is this that you uh, answer that, that this is the whole um, idea there that Oedipus answered the, the, the question of the enigma uh, without uh, having any uh, help as it was usually the case in the right. this, all these uh, stories, uh, mythological stories uh, from ancient Greece with the help of wise men or whatever this or that, or in our times with the help of a dictionary or of riddles, whatever you can um, immediately see if you have the right answer. And here it's precisely, there is no right answer, but the moment you say it, it's the only right answer in the sense that you is you are to bear witness to it with your body and so. And this is another kind of, uh, let's say, but then uh, are you willing to do so or not? I mean, how, what is this? And uh, uh, it's another interesting dialectic. This opens up. But thank you very much. I think it's this kind of uh, uh, libidinal um, part of the enigma that is also uh, extremely important, as you point out. Yeah. Okay. At this point, I think it's a good point to end, actually. And uh, I would like to thank you Off very my much. Sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Thank you very much, Frank, Eric, Chris, and Slavoj. And above all, of course, uh, thank you, Alenka. Thank you first for writing this book. <laughs> and, and above all to you <laughs> <laughs> to navigate and, and, this. And thank you for this presentation and and, uh, and wonderful elucidating additions that you did that you did today. It's really for the people who have read the book, it's been extremely elucidating. For those in the audience who perhaps haven't yet, I hope this has been really an incentive to immediately engage with this book. <laughs>